So the paper is called The Irony of Anatomy, Basquiat's Poetics of Black Positionality. And it has, a, it has an epigraph from an interview with Isabel Gros uh, and Basquiat. Isabel Gros asks, should I come to New York before I write the article on you? Basquiat replies, what would you do if the artists you are writing about were dead? I would do as much research as possible, get together all the available information. And Basquiat replies, then just do it like that, pretend I'm dead. There are two versions of Jean-Michel Basquiat's 1981 painting, Irony of a Negro Policeman, very similar but with several notable differences. The first version, with a red background, includes an object resembling a scepter rising above the left arm. The policeman's genitals are represented by a triangle and three circles in the midsection. Two of Basquiat's signature crowns are featured in the upper left-hand corner. In the final version, the background has been whitewashed. The genitals painted over, leaving the figure castrated by a white gap running through the center of the body. The scepter-like object has been erased, but for a few remaining black streaks. The crowns have been eliminated. The additions to the final canvas are also notable. A foot has been labeled paw left. An abbreviated version of the title has been written in, Irony of Negro Policeman. Above that, a further condensation of the title's significance, simply the word irony circled in the white space of the upper right-hand corner. I'm interested in the relation between key additions to this canvas, a quasi-anatomical label below, the word irony above, and its subtraction of icons of empowerment, so the genitals, crowns, a scepter, as crucial to Basquiat's pictorial treatment of blackness. His way of representing blackness, I will argue, is centrally concerned with the relation between irony, the body, and the body's social determination. Or more precisely, Basquiat's representation's blackness, his way of writing its historical inscription, is driven by a very particular problem. The problem of how the relation between the interiority and exteriority of the body, between its structure and its form, is conditioned by race as a form of social determination. So it's through the relation between irony and anatomy that this problem gets figured in his work, within the conceptual nexus of visual and linguistic meaning that constitutes his compositional field. So I want to give an account of what exactly people mean when they refer to racial issues or problems of race in Basquiat's work an account that focuses upon irony as the medium of his artistic production and upon anatomy as a key part of its historically fraught content. So that is, I want to give an analytically precise account of the role of blackness in his pictorial poetics. So let me first step back for a moment in order to approach a certain relation between irony, anatomy, and blackness from the perspective of a different kind of poetics. And consider Kenneth Goldsmith's uh, now infamous performance of a text titled The Body of Michael Brown uh, in March. It's his reading of a modified version of the Federal Autopsy Report written subsequent to Michael Brown's murder by Darren Wilson, a white police officer in Ferguson, Missouri. Now, Kenneth Goldsmith is a, is a conceptual poet. Uh, he's the co-editor of a volume titled Against Expression, an anthology of conceptual writing. For Goldsmith, conceptual writing involves a non-expressive, or indeed anti-expressive, poetics based on the reproduction, reconfiguration, and performance uh, of already existing texts gleaned from a variety of media. According to Goldsmith, a document like Brown's Federal Autopsy Report, quote, speaks for itself in ways that an interpretation cannot. Defending the anti-expressive poetics of his performance, Goldsmith claims that he didn't add or alter a single word or sentiment that did not pre-exist in the original text. For to do so, he says, would be against my nearly three decades practice of conceptual writing. <coughs> he did, however, rearrange the text, altering the order of the report so that it concluded in his performance uh, with the autopsy's description of the genitals. Goldsmith acknowledges that in altering the report in this way, he altered the text for poetic effect. He says, I always massage dry texts to transform them into literature either oblivious or indifferent to the grotesque connotations of this terminology when applied to a textual description of a dead black man's body. Goldsmith's appropriation and performance has been widely panned for its complicity with the dominance 
uh, with dominance over black people's bodies within a persistent socio-cultural framework of white supremacy. In grappling with this critique, I find it useful to refer to Saidiya Hartman's book, Scenes of Subjection, in which she analyzes racist forms of entertainment, traversing both chattel slavery and post-emancipation American culture, in which the fung fungible black body is made to perform, alive or dead, as a hyper-material extension of the white master's ideas, feelings, or values. In Hartman's lucid account of these supposedly innocent amusements, so quoting Hartman, the fungibility of the commodity makes the captive body an abstract and empty vessel, vulnerable to the projection of others' feelings, desires, and ideas. And as property, the dispossessed body of the enslaved is the surrogate for the master's body, since it guarantees his disembodied universality and acts as the sign of his power and dominion. Thus, while the beaten and mutilated body presumably establishes the brute materiality of existence, the materiality of suffering regularly eludes recognition by virtue of the bodies being replaced by other signs of value, as well as other bodies. Hi, Susie and Jed. Nice to see you. Yeah. <laughs> so in the body of Michael Brown, the poem, the material facticity of Michael Brown's dead body, anatomically labeled and described by the state, is made to perform through Goldsmith's mouth, and thereby converted into a fungible commodity through artistic appropriation, replaced and possessed by the body of a white man. And Goldsmith thinks, or at least he claims he thinks, that his anti-expressive poetics evades the projection of feelings, ideas, desires, and values, evades the expression of these onto the text that he appropriates and reframes. But Goldsmith's performance of the body of Michael Brown made it clear that this was not the case. It was the relation between Goldsmith's body and Michael Brown's body that made the modification and performance of this particular text an expression of white power, articulated in careless dominance over black death. Now, it's the irony of Goldsmith's performance that I want to specify. Namely, he found himself in a position in which his anti-expressive poetics did nothing other than express his whiteness, his own racial positionality. And this irony was not only due to race, but more specifically to a complex conjunction of blackness, whiteness, and anatomy. Many stated that the feelings, ideas, desires, and values the performance projected were those of a colorblind conceptualism that couldn't think through the fact that an autopsy report cannot speak for itself. Instead, Goldsmith spoke for it, and this has contextual consequences. One listener stated that it felt as though Goldsmith was, uh, physically took Michael Brown's body, chewed it up, and spat it back out. The particular violence, then, of the performance resides in its reliance upon such vis visceral responses to generate a sort of success to scandal upon which Goldsmith's practice thrives. If you think you shouldn't do it, you must do it, tweeted Goldsmith on March 1st, a couple weeks prior to his performance. From the incoherence of black death, Frank Wilderson III writes, America generates the coherence of white life. If one is to interrogate rather than merely express this logic, one has to adopt a critically reflexive position upon the parasitic relation of white life to black social death, addressing the dialectical entanglements and unexpected reversals that afflict relations between intention and determination in any discourse on race. In a word, one has to grapple with irony. That will be my effort here, and it was also the difficult effort driving the historical materialism of Basquiat's poetics. Let's turn to Basquiat's 1982 canvas, Obnoxious Liberals, which satirizes something like the structural situation that Goldsmith's performance enacts, unknowingly enacts. The painting is sometimes understood as a rendering of Basquiat's conflicted relation to the art market. But what sort of rendering? And given the title, it makes little sense to read the central figure as a stand-in for Basquiat himself, especially since that figure uh, is dressed in the manner of a trader at a slave auction. The scene of the slave auction offers some structural and historical context for Basquiat's composition. Here we see the black slave bound on one side of the image, while prospective buyers are assembled on the other. In the center, the trader takes bids, selling the slave as a commodity. In Basquiat's piece, these structural positions are replicated by the black figure of Samson on the left, the figure marked by a cowboy hat and dollar signs on the right, and the central figure in his top hat and suit. 
In this case, however, his body, that central figure's body, is overwritten with the words, not for sale. Here's how the Austrian critic and curator, Dieter Buchhardt, handles the apparent ambiguity of this configuration in uh, his introductory essay to the most recently published retrospective catalog on Basquiat's work. He writes, the role of this figure in the center is not clear, as it is placed over a red square and labeled obnoxious liberals, a term of abuse used by conservatives. Does it represent a slave trader, as the clothing seems to indicate, fulminating against liberals, or a critic of the scene, the artist making it clear he is not for sale? Basquiat's demand for freedom and equality, which he saw as threatened by capitalist consumer society, is quite clearly present here. So Buchhardt poses questions, um, but I think he can't quite answer them. Ultimately, he throws up his hands and appeals to Basquiat's demand for freedom and equality to escape an interpretive impasse. But why is the role of the central figure unclear to Buchhardt? First, I think because he does not grasp that obnoxious liberals is a term of abuse that can be hurled from the left as well as from the right, from a radical political position against a reformist position, or from the structural position of blackness toward that of white privilege. Second, Buchhardt can't read the image because he fails to analyze the irony of the phrase not for sale in the compositional context, that is, he reads it in a straightforward way. The conjunction of these two oversights, I think, is important because it links Basquiat's radical politics, rather than liberal politics, directly to his use of irony. The irony of Basquiat's painting, which Buchhardt doesn't see, though it's hidden in plain sight in the relation of the painting's central figure to the double inscription, obnoxious liberals and not for sale, is that the obnoxious liberal occupies the structural position of the slave trader himself. So consider a contemporary example of this irony. Uh, the NGO, Not For Sale, which is a, a global anti-slavery organization with the stated goal of ending human trafficking. Uh, obviously an admirable goal. But the organization's president is co-founder and managing partner of a firm called Just Business, an international investment group uh, that, quote, incubates social enterprises. On the organization's website, the finance manager declares that she is passionate about developing strategic initiatives to connect the untapped potential of isolated economies to the demand of the global market. So here we have sort of NGO as, as capitalist enterprise. It's a case in which a slogan like not for sale articulates an ideal, that human beings or human life or human values are not commodities on the market. But this slogan belies the structural determinations of global capitalism that prop up both human trafficking and the activities of NGOs run by investment bankers. The Liberals' declaration, not for sale, is obnoxious because it enunciates an ideal that disavows the material situation upon which the conditions of the enunciation depend. This is the constitutive gesture of a liberal reformist politics, to disavow the very conditions of enunciation on which uh, a political ideal, the enunciation of a political ideal depends. Thus we can identify the double irony of Buchhardt's reading. He earnestly places the painter in the structural position that the painting satirizes, the, the figure of the, um, the central figure in the painting. In doing so, he projects Basquiat into the position which is in fact his own, um, that of, of the liberal that Basquiat is satirizing as obnoxious. Despite all his difficulties and frustrations, Buchhardt claims, Basquiat maintained a profoundly humanist view of the world, unquote. In other words, we're assured that Basquiat is not just another angry black man. But what is humanism, if not the discourse of the obnoxious liberal, the gruesome discourse of European modernity and of white man's burden? Basquiat's irony sets a trap for the liberal humanist critic, and Buchhardt walks into it. I want to argue that avoiding this trap involves thinking through the manner in which Basquiat's art ironizes the figure of the human, ironizes what Frank Wilderson calls the imposition of humanism's assumptive logic. And this involves moving beyond the good intentions of liberal ideals and recognizing Basquiat's radical interrogations of black positionality. So in a 1985 interview, Basquiat famously remarks that if he were to make films, they would be, quote, ones in which black people are portrayed as being people of the human race, and not aliens, and not all negative, not all thieves and drug dealers and the whole bit, just real stories, unquote. 
This is not, however, the representational strategy of Basquiat's paintings and drawings. In the works he actually makes, um, rather than the films he imagines making, he does indeed depict black people as aliens, as stereotypes, and as figures reduced to the schematic attribute of blackness. That is to say, he does not only depict black life as it is, or as we would like it to be, he depicts black positionality as a social fact um, and as a figural determination. Consider Basquiat's 1983 self-portrait, in which the figure is reduced to a black silhouette. The simplicity of the image belies the complex psychological, historical, and ideological accretions that its composition materializes. It would be easy to read this as a portrait of double consciousness, and it is partly that. The objectifying force of the white gaze reflected back upon, as if from within and looking out, the self-representation of the black subject. But the very readiness of that familiar framework, I think, renders it inadequate to the estranging force of the image. Not only the shadow-like black form, but also the narrowed eyes, the vertical braids, the set jaw, the angular posture of the figure suggest an attitude or style, a certain oblique query. But the question posed by the figural form cannot be answered in abstraction from the viewer's own subjectivity, from his or her own social or cultural positionality in relation to the image. That is to say, the image positions the viewer precisely by being a certain image of black positionality, an image at once generic and nevertheless specific, a certain style of blackness, which one might identify with Basquiat, but to which one will also find oneself responding in a way that marks the particular psychology of one's own gaze as ideologically and historically entangled. What one sees in the image is the question posed by the figure's sightless eyes, the black pupils through which it might participate in the world of light are removed, leaving only a white space through which one looks at the background of figuration or an empty surface at which one stares. Are black people here portrayed as being people of the human race? This may be a question the painting carefully and slyly poses, but I think it's not one that it answers in the affirmative. A similar style of figuration is at issue in Basquiat's elegiac 1984 piece, The Death of Michael Stewart. Here the young graffiti artist, Michael Stewart, beaten to death by the NYPD, is depicted as a black narrow silhouette walking into the background of the composition, framed on either side by pink-faced cops, fanged, wielding billy clubs, and marked by symbols of authority. And the central figure is haloed, as though already otherworldly. He seems already free of the scene of social determination that also kills him. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. While the police at once fade into absence and hem in his path. Over the heads of the figures looms the partially erased word defacement, questioning the attribution of this term to the putative crime rather than the deadly punishment, while caustically answering its own question with a copyright symbol. Power protects the order of property, determining graffiti as criminal and police murder as legal. According to the order of law, one counts as defacement and the other does not. But again, while the image is powerfully critical and polemical, it is not only that, it is also redemptive and honorific. Stuart canonized as a black saint, holy spook, revenant of civil society. Perhaps the painting depicts a relation between spiritual freedom and social determination. But what is that relation? Black social death, the legality of the murder of a black man, comes into contact with the beatification of the soul. The form of the bureaucratic gold star, de star detaches from the policeman's cap and floats onto a heavenly horizon, which is also the tagged wall of social contestation. None of these spaces, these planes of being, existence, and history, are clear of the others. If heaven touches upon the earth, and if angels walk among us, then the hell of social power also contaminates their heavenly transcendence. The horizon of that transcendence is defaced, and the immateriality of the soul is rendered by a smudge of black acrylic. Yet just so, the form of defacement that is the material work of art, or the insistence of the tag on the wall, also makes manifest the struggle of spirit against its oppressive negation. There's an important relation upon which I now want to focus between the figuration of the black outline in such works as these 
and Basquiat's disintegration of the body into anatomical components in so many of his works. Basquiat's interest in anatomy is frequently remarked upon in critical commentaries, and it's always noted that he studied Gray's anatomy, a gift from his mother, while in the hospital after being hit by a car at the age of seven. Similarly, Basquiat's interest in and references to Leonardo's notebooks is often cited, but I'm not sure that the role of the anatomical diagram in his work has been seriously interpreted or theorized. Olivier Bergrun puts us on the right track when he comments that Basquiat's dissection of the body through anatomical representation, quote, articulates a notion of the body as damaged, scarred, fragmented, incomplete, or torn apart once the organic whole has disappeared. He writes that humanity is reduced to a mere idea, a ghostly presence, eerie zombie-like creatures that appear to be coming back from the dead with remnants of fading and furi furiously scrawled writing mark Basquiat's attempt to bridge the abyss between life and its disappearance. Unquote. So the foregrounding of the body's physicality by the anatomical drawing draws our attention to the threshold between life and death, between organic unity and physical objectivity. And Bergrun emphasizes the defamiliarizing pressure such attention places on the idea of the human, reducing its self-evidence to a ghostly presence. Note that in Basquiat's 18-part series, Anatomy, white bones on a black background are presented as generic. As in a textbook like Gray's Anatomy, we encounter drawings of the right humerus presented from front, back, outer, and inner perspectives but we do not encounter any particular humerus. It is the generic structure of these body parts and of the skeleton they compose that is represented, but it's never the individual body which lies outside the representational generalizations of the science of anatomy. Moreover, at least in these diagrams, anatomy operates within a regime of representation removed from any reference to race. It's the interiority of the body, uh, the interior of the body, that offers this apparent reprieve. Though we are shown a female pelvis and a male pelvis, we do not find a pelvis labeled as black or white. While Basquiat's self-portrait, or his homage to Michael Stewart, foreground the raced form of the black body, blackness as such, anatomy shifts the scene from exterior form to interior structure, where the physical objectivity of the body's discrete parts might seem to evade social determination. Yet precisely insofar as it is racially unmarked, anatomy remains marked by race. This is the irony of anatomy. Consider again the scene of Goldsmith's performance. Michael Brown's graduation photo, a portrait of his exterior form, marked by symbols of human accomplishment, serves as a background for the reading, um, through, for Goldsmith's reading through the labeled parts of Brown's dehumanized body. The living human being named Michael Brown is now split between exterior form and interior structure which also marks a split between subject and object, proud graduate, and degraded dead body. The split has already happened. It has already been represented in the media and police reports and is now rendered as art or poetry in the mode of blank commentary. Yet the blankness of the commentary itself is what not only performs, uh, but arguably replicates the violence of the initial division, Brown's death. Why? because it's the living white subject who reiterates the reduction of the body to anatomy and who does so without dialectical reflection upon the politics of this operation. Brown's body is divided between exterior form and interior structure, dead subject, and categorized object, and the expression of Goldsmith's living subjectivity inhabits this rift. Converted from the scandal of Brown's death to the scandal of Goldsmith's performance, this rift is seized upon as an opportunity for the anti-expressive expression of an artistic program. But prior to death, is there any such thing at all as a black subject? The stringent argument of Afro-pessimist theory, running in implicit or explicit terms through the work of Orlando Patterson, Hortense Spillers, Sadia Hartman, Ishiel Mbembe, Frank Wilderson, and Jared Sexton, among others, uh, is, that, is that there is not. To be black, to inhabit black positionality, is to be an object rather than a subject. To live as socially dead, to be the profane residue of white civil society. Who is the slave, and then they asks, if not the person who everywhere and always possesses life, property, and body as if they were alien things. 
Possessing life and body as alien things presupposes that they are like external matter to the person who bears them, who serves as their scaffolding. In such a case, the slave's body, life, and work may be attacked. Thus, the slave is therefore the forename we give to a man or woman whose body can be degraded, whose life can be manipulated, and whose work and resources can be squandered with impunity. Similarly, Frank Wilderson defines the black, uh, capitalizing that term in his work, as a subject who is always already positioned as slave, and therefore puts the term black subject under erasure. A black, he writes, is the very antithesis of the human subject, an anti-human, a position against which humanity establishes, maintains, and renews its coherence, its corporeal integrity. Similarly, Cedia Hartman argues that the givenness of blackness results from the brutal corporealization of the body and the fixation of its constituent parts as indexes of truth and racial meaning. The construction of black bodies as phobogenic objects, estranged in corporeal malediction, and the apparent biological certainty of this malediction attest to the power of the performative to produce the very subject it appears to express. So crucially, Hartman notes that this obstinacy or givenness of blackness is not at all some biological property or essence, um, but nor are the performative occasions that produce it merely performative, since these result in the determination of a concrete social position. And she argues across this work that this social across her book that this social position is maintained in different uh, modalities from slavery through emancipation. So she argues, for example, blacks were incorporated into the narrative of the rights of man and citizen by virtue of the gift of freedom and wage labor. The formerly enslaved were granted entry into the hallowed halls of humanity. And at the same time, the unyielding and implacable fabrication of blackness as subordination continued under the aegis of formal equality. Through the discrepant techniques of domination, particular to slavery and, em and emancipation, she argue argues, blackness is a historical constitutive fixing of the body by terror and dominance. We know that the science of anatomy itself is a historically racist discourse, which contributes to this fixing of the body by terror and dominance. In distinguishing between the races, one reads in the 19th century Chambers American Encyclopedia, quoting, what strikes the ordinary observer chiefly is, of course, the difference of complexion. But the anatomist is fully as much interested in the shape of the skull, unquote. There is thus a diachronic racist history of anatomy, which participates in the synchronic irony of anatomy. And even if anatomical representations are racially unmarked, anatomy's reduction of the, of the body to object status is not unmarked because this reduction bears a different relation to white and black bodies unmarked as subjects or marked as objects. That is to say, the reduction of the body to an object by anatomy replicates the reduction of the black body or the black subject to an object. Thus, through the tension between Basquiat's deployment of racially unmarked anatomical representations and his racially marked representations of black silhouettes, the objectifying force of anatomy is tied in tenuous, complex, uneven, yet harrowing ways to the anti-human positionality of blackness. To put it clearly, my argument is that the quasi-objectivity of anatomy, considered within the, re the relational space of Basquiat's oeuvre, bears a dense representational burden of racial positionality. It's expressive of black social death, of the inhuman ontological status of blackness, and of the brutal persistence of the black slave's position as the rejectamenta of contemporary civil society. Thus, a drawing of teeth is not only a drawing of teeth, but also of the morbid trinkets collected and worn as jewelry by colonizers or plantation masters. A femur is not only a femur, but the being a thing of the colonized. A skull is not necessarily or unproblematically a human skull, but perhaps the so-called Negro skull of modernity's encyclopedia. To be black is always as the title of Basquiat's late canvas has it, to be riding with death, thus split without unity between exterior form and interior skeleton. The irony of the Negro policeman, to be at once excluded from and representative of civil society, is rendered by the irony of anatomy, a black foot showing through the uniform labeled as paw. For Hegel, quote, the Negro is an example of animal man and all his savagery and lawlessness, unquote. 
In Basquiat's composition, the figure of the Negro policeman ironizes the distinctions between animal and man, savagery and civilization, lawlessness and law, upon which civil society and its taxonomic orders are founded. I quote Hegel at this point because I think that Basquiat's treatment of the relationship between anatomy and blackness might suggest a shift in our attention to the foundational analysis of slavery in the phenomenology of spirit. Rather than directing our attention to Hegel's discussion of mastery and bondage, we might consider the relation between slavery and blackness in terms of Hegel's discussion of anatomy and physiology in the chapter on observing reason. Hegel's master-slave dialectic analyzes the thwarted structure of intersubjective recognition in terms of forced labor, and he situates work as the means by which, quote, the bondsman becomes conscious of what he truly is. But in Slavery and Social Death, Orlando Patterson is at pains to distinguish his analysis from Hegel's on the basis that work is not constitutive of the relational structure of slavery. Rather, he argues, the constitutive elements of slavery are gratuitously violent domination, natal alienation, and general dishonor. Frank Wilderson constructs his account of the slave's grammar of suffering on this basis, focusing upon the figure of the black as an accumulated and fungible object rather than an exploited and alienated subject, and resisting the incorporation of black suffering into humanism's assumptive logic of self-recognition. Wilderson calls for an account of the political ontology of black positionality addressed to the slave's objecthood, to accumulation and fungibility, to the unbridgeable gap, quoting, between black being and human life, unquote, rather than addressed to the relational overcoming through labor of alienation. Hegel's chapter on observing reason offers interesting, if oblique, resources for such an account. Here, Hegel analyzes the relation between spirit and corporeality, culminating in the infinite judgment of reason that the being of spirit is a bone. His discussion of corporeality returns to the opposition between philosophy and anatomy with which he opens the phenomenology, having distinguished on the first page of the, of the preface between the truth of philosophical science and the mere, quote, aggregate of information presented by the vulgar empiricism of anatomy, quoting again, the knowledge of the parts of the body regarded as inanimate, unquote. As a form of knowledge, Hegel argues, anatomy operates through accumulation rather than the synthetic power of reason. Thus, the chapter on observing reason might be viewed as the apex of the phenomenology, insofar as it's here that this opposition between rational truth and mere empiricism, idealism and materialism, uh, are reconciled in the infinite judgment. Reason grasps, grasps the manner in which it is not reduced to, but rather encompasses and subsumes material being. The being of spirit is a bone, is an infinite judgment, insofar as it expresses the unity of substance and subject, of physical matter and living movement, of objective reality and rational truth. Left to its own devices, however, separated from this sublation, anatomy is the other of philosophy. It accumulates information about the negative, finite object that resists spirit's claim upon subjective infinitude. Transposed into history, anatomy thus occupies the place of blackness, of the slave. It shares the position of intractability that Hegel assigns uh, to the figure he calls the Negro. Quoting Hegel, intractability is the distinguishing feature of the Negro character, he writes. The condition in which they live in, is incapable of any development or culture, and their presence is as it has always been. Thus, Hegel's account implies that slavery and emancipation, but crucially, emancipation grasped as predicated upon, and thus requiring slavery, are necessary for the historical redemption of the ahistorical Negro. For Hegel, quote, Africa proper is that unhistorical and undeveloped land which is still enmeshed in the natural spirit, and which had to be mentioned here before we cross the threshold of world history itself, unquote. It's only through colonialism and slavery, through the transubstantiating incorporation of the Negro into white history, that Africa crosses the threshold of world history. The crossing of this threshold is the constitution of blackness as the barred substance of whiteness, and as a position of social death through which white life attains its world historical apotheosis, what we can call modernity. Hegel's Negro occupies precisely the position of the negative bone, 
which must be subsumed by infinite spirit. The Negro is the object that is only in itself, not for itself, in separation from the soul of human reason. In the synchronic medium of his art, through his obsession with the apparently ahistorical objectivity of anatomy, which ironically betrays the objectifying force of history itself, Basquiat paints the contradiction of black positionality to be alive yet dead, to be the split substance without unity of the totalized exterior form of the black body and the physical objectivity of its fragmented interior structure. It is the sheer force of this asynthetic being, blackness, that shines forth in Basquiat's most triumphant paintings in which he portrays not only black positionality, but the relation between black positionality and black power. In Untitled 1982, the halo intersects the skull bone directly. And what we are looking at is not the redemptive portrayal of black people as human beings with real stories, that is the narrative logic of humanism, but rather a power whose asynthetic energy seems to expel the human altogether. Empty eyes, no face, glove fists rather than the expressive pathos of articulated hands, an inhuman skull, a horn that turns into a halo. In Basquiat's great painting, Prophet One, the right hand is a skeletal form, while the head is outlined in white as if to suggest a black skull. The separated bared teeth and hollow eyes are those of a voodoo doll, also suggested by the striking red garb that sets off the figure from the black background while the letters of the grid to the left associate the figure with a West African griot, praise singer, historian, oral poet, communal elder. The gold halo, which also suggests a crown of thorns, shines over and behind the figure's head, drawing the gaze and marking the griot's fraught beatitude. The composition is violently expressive and powerfully energetic, at once triumphant and bleak, charged with a kind of riven dynamism. And indeed, the figure is also powerfully consonant with contemporary anti-racist struggles, in which the gesture of raised hands, hands up, don't shoot, expresses a conversion of black positionality, the position of the putative criminal confronted by the cops, into black power, the assertive action of resistance against the persistence of white supremacy in civil society. This conversion of position into power expresses a scathing political irony directed against the physical imperatives of oppression, the bodily postures and submissive attitudes that it demands thrown back with an avenging power. The skeletal specter of black suffering rises from the grave, summoned by the displaced terms of prayer, from rest in peace to rest in power. It's not that power entirely overcomes positionality in this painting. Rather, it's as though the two collide mingle or perhaps transpire through one another in the medium of an irony that insists, that holds, while staging the affective and cultural integuments of oppression and resistance. With the dramatic ent entrance of the West African griot onto the center stage of American painting, the canvas resonates, shudders with the force of the return of the repressed. A clock on the left points to 12. Good morning, midnight. Let me introduce you to the high noon of history. I've been describing and analyzing some of the pictorial strategies, political implications, and conceptual contradictions drawn into Basquiat's of by the irony of the Negro policeman, the irony of the obnoxious liberal, the irony of Basquiat's stated intention, but actual refusal to portray black people as people of the human race with real stories, a refusal that breeds, on the contrary, representations of aliens, stereotypes, and voodoo dolls that splits the black subject between exterior form and interior structure. And from this split, this rupture produces imposing images of inhuman power. The irony of Basquiat's remarks about humanistic representation may bear partly upon the disjunction between the diachronic narrative capacities of cinema and the synchronic medium or the synchronic format of the painting or drawing. When he alludes to the humanist vocation of his cinematic ambitions, should we conclude that while Basquiat paints predominantly anti-humanist positions and powers on canvas, he may indeed have portrayed human stories on celluloid? Or was he merely toying with his interlocutor as he, as he was wont to do? That's a question that we cannot answer, but it suggests another that we can, and this will be the last section of the paper. How does Basquiat portray the temporal movement of history through the static media of painting 
or drawing? We can approach this question through the relation between anatomical and historical reference in the interlinking series of 32 drawings uh, produced in 1982 to 1983 known as the Darrow Suite. Don't worry, I'm not going to analyze all 32 of them. Um, but here in peptic ulcer, for example, the surface is occupied um, by anatomical and quasi-mechanical drawings labeled diagrammatically and intersecting with networked geometrical designs. What we could call anatomical style disarticulates and distributes the coherence of the body, the organic relation among its parts across the compositional field. In dog leg study, also from the same suite, wherein the word anatomy is framed beneath the title of the piece, anatomical drawings of bones, joints, and feet are combined with jotted historical inscriptions. U.S. troops pull out of Haiti, 1936. See occupation, Nazi, Paris, World War II. Uh, an inscription that links Caribbean and European history just before and just after, uh, sorry, just before and during the Second World War in order to suggest the hypocrisy of American foreign policy, right? Linking the occupation of Haiti with the Nazi occupation of Paris. On the left, a schematic drawing of a body is labeled Negroes as portrayed in the 30s and 40s under erasure. Drawings of American coins are linked to anatomical representation through the all-seeing eye of truth at the bottom of the canvas and by the profile portrait on the coin itself. It seems that the anatomical label provides a model for textual reference that carries over into Basquiat's historical illusions, through, through which words mark the taking place of events or historical figures rather than the parts of the body, kind of diagrammatic style. In the crowded pictorial and referential space of 50 cent piece, this relation between anatomy and history takes on its most complicated formulation. The title refers to the Jamaican 50 cent note and later coin, which feature the profile of Marcus Garvey commemorating his role in the achievement of Jamaican independence. Garvey was a Pan-Africanist leader, the founder of the Universal Negro Improvement Association, and a key figure in the Back to Africa movement. And in 1919, he founded the Black Star Line, uh, a shipping company devoted to enhancing trade between black businesses in Africa and the Americas, and also potentially to facilitating passage uh, of black passengers back across the Atlantic to Africa. Thus, the Black Star Line might be viewed as a kind of historical reversal of the slave ship a reversal called to mind by diagrammatic drawings of the arc surrounding the image of Garvey on the canvas. The relation between the black star line and the slave ship splits the figure of the arc and implies through this splitting the retrospective irony of its double function as a redemptive vessel and also a hold for inhuman cargo. In the bottom left corner of the composition, we find an X-ray photo of Garvey's head with anatomical labels marking the medulla, the motor, motor area, the cerebrum, the jaw, the nostril, and the forehead. Just to the right of that, we find a list of Jamaican exports and agricultural industries. Royal Sugar Corp, Sugar Cane, White Rum, Bananas, Pineapple. In other corners of the piece, we find, again, references to the American occupation of Haiti, to the dictatorship of Francois Papadoc Duvalier in the 1960s, propped up in part by the Americans, to, uh, to Toussaint Leverteur, the leader of the Haitian Revolution in the, late, uh, in the late 18th century. There's also a reference to Operation Bootstrap, an American intervention into the Puerto Rican economy in 1948, industrializing the country through economic incentives in order to bolster US trade. Thus, the field of political, historical, and economic reference in 50 Cent Peace ranges between revolution and reaction in Haiti American political and economic imperialism in the Caribbean, Garvey's leadership of the Pan-Africanist movement in the US, and decolonization struggles in Jamaica. The tensions between these references are crystallized in the central section of the composition, where Bank of Jamaica hovers over the phrase back to Africa, the letters of which are shifted and erased until transformed into the word bauxite, the primary mineral source of aluminum, which is the material from which Jamaican coins are minted. From back to Africa to bauxite, 
Basquiat's word game performs a dour historical materialist poetics, indexing the bitter irony of the fact that Jamaica's movement from colonialism to independence will also become a movement from industrialization to eventual, to eventual structural adjustment and deepening class inequality, coinciding with the release of the first aluminum coins in 1976. Um, a historical movement whose context in the global economy is suggested by the reference to Operation Bootstrap just below the word bauxite. The painful lapsing of pan-Africanist aspirations into neoliberal incorporation is presided over by Garvey's image, stamped upon the very substance extracted from Jamaican soil and circulated by an institution both symbolic of Jamaican independence, the Bank of Jamaica, and of the dystopian tendential predominance of economic structures over political victories. Working again at the intersection of black power and black positionality, where the dynamism of Garvey's political life and thought meets the stasis of his mineral monetized image, Basquiat immerses his art in the medium of historical irony. Last page. I've been arguing that such historical irony is linked in Basquiat's work with the irony of anatomy. The specification of the apparently generic body is the body of blackness, a link that is suggested, I think, by the close resemblance of his black and white anatomical series on the right to perhaps his greatest catalog of historical reference, Tuxedo on the left, and you can't see it very well and I don't have time to go through it, but um, it operates in the same style of uh, historical illusion as some of the canvases we've been looking at on a massive scale. My claim is that anatomical representation offers a pictorial and linguistic model for the representation of history in Basquiat's work, a history that appears as a mere aggregate of information, a jumble of incongruous reference, but is in fact drawn together and is of by the ironic relation between black positionality and black power. The contradiction between these is depicted um, in the central panel of Tuxedo, actually right here, where the name um, of Al Jolson, the early 20th century blackface performer, appears below that of Malcolm X. And Jolson's name is written at the static center of coordinate axes, while Malcolm X's is written beside a circular arc, not quite closed in upon itself, as if to turn the coordinates below. The tension between positionality and power hovers over Tuxedo, as it does over so many canvases, in the resonant form of Basquiat's iconic crown, symbol of a power at once craved and detested, like the vexed mark of property of market value, knowingly inscribed across Basquiat's work in the form of a copyright symbol. Even the phrase, birth of earth, is tagged with a mark of property uh, in a drawing titled Formless, as if the event of the planet's genesis were retroactively claimed by linguistic and legal codes. In such, a minuscule but, in such minuscule but weighty inscriptions, language encounters matter in the gestural movement of an oil stick upon a page, as the bones of the artist who knows himself to be both a slave and a free man move in rhythm and intention with his form, with his skin, painting a femur, a crown, a black shadow, a halo around a head or a circle around the letter C, and the movement of history, contested demarcations of property, make their mark in obscure arrangements of words cast across the surface, put under erasure, and rewritten a long time after the birth of Earth, that awful collusion of matter and form with a long time still to come. Thanks.